Today's talk is authentication proxy attacks. Um, I got to admit, um, finding out that I was right after Josh Corman, the indomitable Josh Corman, was was it was a bit intimidating. Um, but uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about this, and and a, a few of the things Josh said um, resonated with me. Um, the, the first is the fact that it's, it's up to us, it's up to all of us um, to, to make this difference, make the difference in the organizations that you all collectively represent. Um, so in this talk, um, my focus is on the practical. Um, I'm hoping that everybody, regardless of where you are, right, so we talked about Wendy Nather's security poverty line, Google it if you haven't heard it, but I know that many of you are below some of you are above. My goal here is not just to speak to the people who are at or above, the well-resourced, right? The ones who can send you here and you know, pay your way and all that kind of stuff. I wanna make sure that everybody has the opportunity to take something back with them. So a little bit about myself. My name is Chris Merkel. I'm a senior director of cyber defense at Northwestern Mutual, which is an insurance company. Uh, I've been doing security for a long time, long enough where I stop telling, telling you what it is in years, because i just rather not. It's been too long. Um, I've been coming to B-Sides Las Vegas on and off for over a decade now. Uh, I love this conference. I love the vibe, I love the people that come here. This is, hands down, top five. Uh, I like to reverse engineer malware for fun. Most of my days are spent uh, leading teams of people who do the fun things. So I, I still try to uh, spend my time doing that. I also have um, bad habits and opinions. Uh, yeah, I like Nano over Vim. Um, uh, I have been convinced that pineapple actually does taste good on pizza, so my mind can be changed. And I put those two bullet points in to remind myself that my terrible opinions and decisions do not represent those of my employer. That's like a, that's like a little mental bookmark right there. All right. And then the last point here. Uh, I got to meet John McAfee here almost 10 years ago. How many of you were here when he came to, to B-Sides? A couple of you? That was wild, okay? Um, that experience of uh, uh, hearing him get grilled in depth by people who understood uh, facts, details, and timelines was, was, was crazy. Um, and reflecting on it, my first point here about being in security for a long time, the longer I've been in security, the longer I can start to understand John McAfee's uh, uh, overall uh, arc to go from cybersecurity luminary to bath salts enthusiast <laughs> to crypto grifter. I used to think, man, how did that happen? And now I've been doing this for a while, I'm kind of like, that doesn't sound half bad. <laughs> um, I'll have my contact information on the last slide as well. Um, you can find me on the, uh, the, the Fediverse and uh, on the Zuckerverse. Um, I'm out there right now. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that the, the stuff I'll be talking about here is uh, not solely my research. Um, I work with some of the uh, most brilliant people working in cybersecurity, in counter threat, in intelligence, in threat hunting, in incident response, in detection engineering. Um, and, and I am sharing that collective knowledge with all of you. So let's talk about all of you. You did it. You got multi-factor authentication. Look, it is the year 2023. And I know some of you are thinking to yourselves, 
Well, yeah, but mostly. Oh, okay, that's fine. But take the victory lap. Okay? That's a big deal. If you've pushed your organization through, if you've had those conversations about uh, user experience and the challenges that come with that, particularly if you're working with uh, consumers, clients, people outside your organization, those are tough conversations. You did good. Now, some of you may have also moved on from SMS. Okay? Uh, SMS is weak, but SMS is great. Okay? It can be both. I'll talk a little bit about why that is. If you're in this position, most of the threats that your organization faces um, against your, your logons, your sign-ons, your authentication, you've mitigated those. That's great. Okay? Um, but as we know, our adversaries, they change their tactics, and we're going to talk about that. So um, with the, the good news comes the bad news. And, and the bad news is that even while you might have multi-factor authentication, protecting your organization and its assets, increasingly, it is not enough. So we're starting to see uh, attacks that were really demonstrated to be possible like well over five years ago starting to actually materialize, okay? Um, so we, we're, we're seeing these, these types of campaigns going on. And so what I'm going to be talking about is an evolution in adversarial tradecraft that's taking your typical adversary in the middle and moving it to the next layer um, for, for targeting organizations uh, for whom they've done those fundamental cyber hygiene basics like turn on multi-factor authentication, okay? So that's the bad news. Now, um, shout out to CISA. So CISA entered this conversation about uh, almost two years ago, and they, they released a, a paper on this. I strongly recommend you look it up, but I have summarized it for you. Um, it, it's, it's fantastic. And what I love in particular about this, and, and by the way, again, another shout out to Josh Corman. He talked about changing the dialogue, changing the framing, right? So what did we used to say? We used to say that you need to make sure you have strong authentication. And, and if you got into the weeds with somebody, they would say, well, I've got a long password, so that's strong authentication. Oh, no, 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 oh, no, 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 you, you need, Multi-factor authentication is strong authentication. Well, okay, okay, I, I can do that, I can do that. Well, well, the problem is, and I'm gonna assume most of you understand this problem to some extent or another, um, these other second factors have weaknesses, and specifically, the weakness of token theft is what I'm gonna talk about today. And so they embraced the term phishing resistant Multi-factor authentication. Now, here's why I love that term. It's a term of art. I'm saddened that it was first an industry term before CISA came up with it. But what that means is, as you are talking to the decision makers in your organization, and they're gonna ask you questions like, are we resistant to phishing attacks? You might say, are we okay? You might say, it's time for your outrageous speaker request. My what? When we uh, have speakers who apply to speak in the program, we have this thing called uh, an outrageous speaker request. It's a little field at the very end of the, uh, the application okay. that uh, gives them a chance to ask for anything else they might want. What did I ask for? Case, it, was, it was really late at night. In this case, uh, we were asked to bring back green apple Skittles, which yes, has been please. Yes. discontinued and replaced uh, with Lime, I believe, again. But lime is terrible. got rid of the lime. For those who are not up on the, the drama of Skittles, lime was around. They got rid of it. They put it in green apple. Now they got rid of green apple, brought back the lime, and so now everybody's angry. This is, it's a classic Coke, new Coke thing. Anyway, 
So there is now on change.org uh, a petition to bring back green apple Skittles. And I have here flyers to hand out to everybody in the audience. Uh, I ask you to please consider honoring our speaker's request and helping us to bring back green apple Skittles here at B-Sides. Change the world, one person, one thing at a time. One Skittle at a time. So, so according to this handout that he's provided me, the change.org petition only has 834 signatures. That means if every one of you in this room, by my rough count, went and petitioned for this change, we could get this over 1,000 people. We can do this. All right, let me transmission back into uh, where I was. All right. So, so again, we're talking about changing the framing to change the discussion. If you are talking with your leaders, again, if you're talking with your CISO, CIO, board member, and they want to ask you, are we resistant to phishing attacks? Now your answer can be some, but not all. We don't run phishing resistant authentication in our organization. And it's not just your opinion. Now you can bring up Eagle Shield because that carries a lot of weight. We'll talk a little bit more about the technical mechanics of this in a minute, I promise. Token replay attacks are on the rise. Um, I don't know if you, any of you have um, read the long form Wired article on the hack at EA, but it is fantastic. Um, and I strongly encourage you to, to look at what can happen when you start with one stolen Slack token, okay? Uh, this data is a little old. Um, but it comes from a good source from, from Microsoft. Um, I do reserve the right to give them grief, um, but they've been making some positive moves, so I might pull my punches. But we can see that the use of tokens is on the rise. So let's get into uh, how this all works. Now, it's a bit of a complicated diagram, and I'm going to keep staring at this screen over here because it's, it's a little bit bigger than I can see on my presenter view. But we're going to walk through, step by step, technically, how this attack works. Okay? So, so first, it's going to start with a phishing message. You all get this. Okay? Your victim is going to enter their creds, and they're going to enter in their MFA. Now, that could be uh, a code request from SMS. That could be a device approval. Uh, something along those lines. Now, again, I'm not talking about uh, FIDO2, WebAuthn. This is everything that's not that, I think. The attacker has a proxy setup. So what they're doing here is they are taking your actual logon page and just proxying it. They're not making a copy. They're not doing, like, copy and paste into Word and then back into HTML. I always laugh when I see Word HTML in adversary uh, pages and stuff like that. It really cracks me up. It also makes me sad because it totally still works. <laughs> um, and what's going to happen is when they put their credentials in, that's going to get forwarded across the proxy to your identity provider. So your identity provider is like, oh, I, I, I've received credentials because they were asked for. They were, they were requested by this proxy. and now I'm getting this back. This all looks normal to me. The attacker along the way is going to steal the credentials because, you know, you can use those later, even if you're not, even if your, your primary target is the token. The identity provider, they don't know what's up. This is just a request from a client for auth. That's normal. So they're going to go, yep, everything checks out. MFA, A-OK, -okay, here's your session token. Now, the attacker is like, yeah, cool. I have your session token. That session token, that gets passed right back to the user. 
So, so the other thing you tend to run into with these phishing attacks is the what have you done once you've actually updates. Thank you, Jamf. Um, what do you do when uh, you've, you've successfully conned that person? You have to take them somewhere. And, and, and this is where, where, where adversaries are kind of like, eh, I don't know. Maybe I'll dump you at google.com or something. Who knows? Or my, whatever, right? Um, but by forwarding that, that session token back, your user has a valid session. So where do they go next? They go to the actual site that they've just authenticated to. So to them, from their perspective and experience, they just successfully logged in. Why? Because they just successfully logged in. Because that's how this works. Now, that becomes a real problem for your security awareness and education, right? Because at this point, nothing looks different. You've successfully logged in. The documents that you've most recently worked on on Microsoft 365, they're all there. So now, what does the attacker do? They just replay the session token. Now, um, I, I, I'm not an expert in, um, you know, all of the Microsoft primary tokens, refresh tokens, sub tokens, app tokens. It's complicated. Suffice it to say, if you can get your hands on that primary refresh token, uh, by default in Microsoft 365, you have seven days of access that you can parlay. Uh, and then, of course, you know, those creds go on to secondary markets, maybe get used in password spray attacks. Uh, go find those little uh, corners and edge cases in your organization where uh, you haven't quite gotten that two-factor authentication in yet. So let's talk a little bit about delivery. Um, I could give a whole talk on this. Instead, I'm going to give one slide. Um, Delivery m methods are getting pretty interesting, in my opinion. Um, first and foremost, we are seeing these types of advanced MFA proxy attacks coming across bog standard, dumb phishing emails. Okay, still works. Why? Why? Why change? Right. We're also seeing what I call encrypted message hollowing, um, and. What this is is so if you've if you've ever uh, used a you know proof point uh, Microsoft sending to Gmail um, Mimecast etc. You've gotten this message that says you have a, a secure message waiting for you. You need to log into a portal. Yada yada yada. Okay. Most of the time, those types of systems are used in business to consumer type of relationships. And what that means is you don't want to necessarily burden that poor end user with having to set up full MFA or whatever it is just to read that one important email that you want to send them about uh, a, a healthcare issue, about a financial transaction, uh, about a real estate deal, whatever it is, right? Well, what attackers are doing is they're gaining access to one of these encrypted messages. How do they do it? A traditional account takeover. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. They hit a link, maybe they do a password reset, whatever it is, and they get into that corporate uh, email encryption solution from one of these big name vendors. And if it's not configured properly, they go into this message and they hit the reply button. But then what they do is they just blank out everything in there. Um, or I'm sorry, they don't hit reply, they hit forward. Critical difference. They're going to hit forward on that message and they're going to blank out the message body, they're going to blank out the subject line, and they're going to push you in as a target. Now, instead of having to create those goofy looking, fakey, you have an encrypted document kind of nonsense that could potentially be taken down because it is part of adversary infrastructure and all of that, they are now landing at your big corporation's encrypted messaging solution. But what they're seeing is a wholly new message. And we have witnessed uh, one adversary group literally make hay from one account and one message, just blanking it out and using it over and over and over and over and over again. And every time the recipient gets, you've got a secure message, they're not going to get any warnings, and it comes from a big corporation. 
And so the big corporation is inherently trusted. We're also seeing account takeovers uh, in the Microsoft 365 space abusing Microsoft Purview. Microsoft Purview is the encryption solution that used to be called something else. Uh, I guess their branding, rebranding worked because I can't remember the old one. Um, but it's basically when you hit send secure in Microsoft Outlook, uh, that's Microsoft Purview messaging. As a tenant administrator or as a exchange administrator, you have very little ability to inspect what goes into that, okay? And, and if somebody is in the Microsoft 365 world and they receive a purview message, it actually gives the attackers additional credibility because you get this green banner across the top of your outlook that says, congratulations, this message is encrypted. And if you're the end user and you see a green bar with a green check mark in it, how do you interpret that? Do you, do you as, a, as the end, do our end users go, wow, that's fantastic. They employed transit encryption on this. I feel good about that. No, the way they interpret this is, oh, bar is green, I'm safe. I don't have to think about those security awareness messages anymore. Click. If you're sending it outside of a Microsoft organization, you're gonna, you know, to Gmail, whatever, you're gonna get that typical log into the portal. Uh, you'll get a message attachment. That message attachment is fully encrypted. You can't inspect any of this. And that really uh, is, is unfortunate. So I talked a bit about what the, the victim experience is like. This is what it looks like. The only thing that you're gonna see different is the URL in the browser bar. Uh, you can't, can't fake that out. Um, you can do tricky things right to left. I don't, you know, uh, you know all those obfuscation techniques that, that we know and love. But again, your security awareness messaging, it's a lot less effective at this point. Why? Because if, you're, if you have a branded portal, like I show off one on the right here, um, this is the one they see every single day. If it's a standard Microsoft logon, it's the standard Microsoft logon. So what's your click rate already on fake logons? It's pretty bad, right? But when you have nothing to tell somebody, I mean, yeah, you can tell them, go, go look at the browser bar. But, but again, think about this whole attack chain from end to end. You receive an encrypted message from a well-known reputable corporation. Maybe it's something, somebody you already do business with because they've done account takeover for that outside organization you're working with. You receive an encrypted message. The encrypted message has a green bar on it. Now it's trusted. You click on that. I do not believe that it is even fair to ask our users to catch this. So let's talk a little about the evolution of tradecraft. Um, I'll, uh, one of my colleagues um, shares my same passion for, for terrible clip art. Um, so there's your, your dolly generated hacker. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, our adversaries are also evolving their tradecraft. So we are seeing a lot more anti-inspection techniques. Okay, so, so, so even if you'd gotten to the point where you were extracting all of the URLs from your email traffic um, and things like that, passing that through some sort of reputation service, sandbox, whatever it is, doing that, you know, uh, in bulk, um, you're, you're probably not gonna catch it. Why? They're doing things like referrer checking, right? They wanna make sure that this looks like it came from an email click, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, they're doing, you know, basic sandbox detection stuff um, like I said, they're using uh, encrypted email. They're also um, looking for uh, egress IPs. So if they're targeting uh, you know, a specific corporation or set of corporations and you're not coming from one of those egress IPs that's noted on uh, the, the Aaron uh, or Ripe or whatever net blocks, you're, you're just gonna get redirected somewhere else. Um, beyond that, they're, they're doing a lot of uh, redirect chains um, and, and other obfuscation techniques, right? So your, your typical automated sandbox that's gonna look at a web page, um, 
maybe it'll follow one refer, maybe two, not six. So that becomes uh, a bit of a challenge uh, to do any kind of inspection at scale. Um, so let's talk about how we detect these things. Um, I did put in the, uh, the description of this talk that there is one fatal flaw. There is. It's a bit weak. So if you don't like it, I'm sorry. Um, but you know, yeah, you gotta put butts in seats. What are you gonna do? Um, so let's talk about detecting attacks. Um, first and foremost, none of these things individually is gonna be the tell, the detection, the one thing that allows you to catch 100%, 80%, 60%. But if you treat these as signals, if you have the ability to, to look at multiple dimensions, if you have the ability to do any type of correlation, you can build strong signals out of this. Um, depending on the, the nature of the organization you represent, uh, impossible travel is reasonably accurate. Uh, the problem is that uh, all of your users who watch YouTube have now installed NordVPN after the three month trial subscription. Um, and it's all running on their phones all of the time. Um, and n not, not just picking on Nord, uh, they're fine for, for, for what they are other than uh, snake oil for consumers. Um, they do, they go to great lengths to hide their, their egress traffic. Why? Because the only reasonable reason to use a consumer VPN service is so you can watch content outside your region, right? And so you're always in this cat and mouse game between uh, your uh, streaming video providers of the world and you know them having to comply with restrictions around uh, uh, countries and intellectual property and things like that. Um, so, so what that means is as a defender, you're gonna, you're gonna get hits from weird places on the planet with really non-descriptive names. And oftentimes, if you do more analysis on ASNs, some really sketchy neighborhoods, okay? Um, and, and so you're gonna go, oh, oh I'm, I'm under attack. Well, no, no, just Bob in accounting was, you know, watching YouTube and installed a VPN. Um, and then of course, the other challenge is the use of uh, uh, proxies, um, proxy services, so that you can tunnel out machines here in the US. There are, there are large and, and very um, well-known ones uh, that we see used a lot. Um, so, so what we try to look for is, is a little bit of correlation, right? So um, do I have a person logging in from an IP address that they haven't logged in from before? And is there an authenticator change of some kind? Like a password reset, uh, in addition uh, to their, their multi-factor authentication options, uh, a change in those authentication options, things like that. Um, also look for new device registration attempts. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about conditional access policies later, um, but you know, as of right now, I believe that the standard default configuration in a Azure tenant is to allow devices to register themselves in Azure AD across the internet just because you're authenticating, right? Um, so you're gonna wanna look for um, gaining persistence. So going back to the, uh, the, the hack that happened at EA, um, that's one of the things they did. They, they did an actual device enrollment as a persistence mechanism. Uh, I believe they used a virtual machine. So that's what you can do a lot on the, the detection side. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about um, investigating these types of attacks, responding, and those kinds of things. So first of all, has successful MFA occurred? Um, Microsoft's uh, logs, if you're, if you're taking these somewhere other than uh, Azure Sentinel, um, they are a nested maze of terribly constructed JavaScript, Java 
uh, JSON that um, you, you know will take you a long time to figure out, and, and that sucks. Um, do you know how to invalidate session tokens? So in a lot of organizations, if if you have reasonable confidence in your external MFA and somebody clicks on something and enters their creds, you can issue a soft password reset. It's nicer to the user because they just change their password next logon and you just kind of coast by knowing that they're okay because there wasn't, uh, you, you've got MFA protecting you. The problem is in, 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 a, in a session attack um, against tokens, um, that soft password reset in Azure, that does not invalidate the session token. Okay, so, so even if you detect the user clicking on a phishing email or, and, and, and entering their credentials, you do that soft password reset, the attacker's still in, they still have that token. Now here's what sucks, you gotta do a hard password reset and by hard password reset, I mean change it to an arbitrary value of your choosing and then make them figure out how to recover. Call the help desk, you know, the self-service password portal, probably not gonna work because the attacker could use it, right? Um, that is really, really um, not great user experience, um, but that's where we are right now. So beyond uh, just Microsoft specific tokens, think about the other things that the attacker might have had access to, Slack, um, uh, other, other uh, you know, federated systems or, or other systems that might have provided their own token that's not tied necessarily to the, uh, the SAML token that comes with Azure AD. Um, you're going to want to look at your Microsoft 365 logs for evidence of access. So what did they do once they got here? Um, the m thing that I've seen most commonly is mail forwarding rules, right? Because while the attack is a little more sophisticated, these are people who are just using software as a service like Evil Proxy, okay? They are not the geniuses who invented the technique they're the ones using the commoditized kit that they paid money for. So the, the adversaries are still the same lowest common denominator kind of folks. So, so, so you know, un unless you're in a, a, a more highly targeted sector with more advanced adversaries, most of y'all are just dealing with cybercrime and, and what do they want to do? They just want to compromise that mailbox. So they'll set up a, like a, an exchange mail forwarding, or not, a, not an exchange, but an outlook mail forwarding rule. Um, you want to look for user creation events, right? What kind of a, a account did they compromise? Um, did they access data on, on, on OneDrive and, and things like that? Um, I should also point out that in the last two, month or so, um, uh, CISA uh, successfully bullied Microsoft into giving full log access to people who have Microsoft 365 tenants. Um, I don't know the full scope of what that means, um, but that is forthcoming. Um, and shout out to CISA because nobody should have to pay for logs. That's bullshit. So let's talk about continuing to go on the offensive, threat hunting. Um, make sure you know your authentication endpoints. Um, you can do Shodan hunts. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. Um, look for the usual typo squats, page titles, things like that. Um, if there's a page title that's specific to the Microsoft logon flow, you should never see that come from anywhere other than Microsoft. So if that page title exists and you can detect that in your network traffic, if you have the inspective capability to do so, Look for it. So do you know where all your authentication endpoints are? Uh, you probably have some authentication endpoints that should be on a milk carton. Um, look at your Microsoft conditional access policies. Um, it, it's almost cliche, but they, they, people say that identity is the new perimeter. I tend to agree with that. Um, and Microsoft conditional access policies, if identity is the new perimeter, conditional access policies are the new firewall. And it's the new firewall in that it really is a pain in the neck to configure and you can screw it up easily in unintended ways. 
okay? Because conditional access policies have the same concept of inheritance. Uh, they have, you can get order of operations wrong, and the evaluation of a cap policy can go wrong, and you don't realize it because staring at it on the screen, it looks right, just like your firewall console. So there are ways to, to evaluate your cap policies. The, the more that you can do to strengthen your cap policies uh, for users coming in from outside your network perimeter, the better. I know some organizations can, can uh, have more latitude in that than others. Um, you want to look for attempts to target your organization. So again, look for uh, type of squats related to SSO. Hunt inside your firewall logs. Um, you, know, uh, you, you know, DNS logs, passive DNS. You can hunt externally. Um, so in a, in a previous iteration of this talk, um, I was able to, to demonstrate that I could find a whole bunch of people on Shodan running evil proxy and evil Nginx. Um, because of the use of those redirect change I talked about before, that's getting increasingly difficult. Um, but the main things we see are evil proxy, which is the software as a service version of evil Nginx, and evil Nginx itself. Now, one of the things you can do is look for things like jarm hashes. Um, they're not rotating out the default TLS certificates that come with this software. So, um, you know, they're bad at tradecraft. Um, so, so, and then I'm sorry, there was one thing I wanted to go back to and point out here, if we go back to the victim experience. Now, there are, if you get down into the DOM in Microsoft or a custom branded page, and, and this, is, this is that, you know, here's that, that one weird trick kind of thing. Um, there are elements in this DOM that only exist in this DOM, okay? For example, on that Microsoft sign-in page, there are links to a domain called msauth.net. As far as I can tell, the only time that domain is called is when you are doing authentication to Microsoft. So if you see that um, in your network traffic coming from a source that is not Microsoft, that means somebody is proxying the traffic. You can catch it. Another thing that you can do is you can look for people who are faking your corporate identity. That color blue is a very, very specific hex code. I know blue is the cool color for most corporations, but I guarantee you they're not all using the same shade of blue, okay? So the marketing department is gonna make sure that that RGB code that represents our cherished corporate identity is unique, okay? So now, again, if you, if, and I, this is that poverty line discussion, so I'm sorry if you're not in this position, but if you are in a position where you can inspect inbound web traffic, you can start to profile for people using your corporate identity. Then you start to tune out and filter out the people that are known, right? That, that SaaS provider that made a copy of your logon, that's totally okay, right? Uh, any, any other additional logons you might have to your, your sites and systems. And then you can catch them using your color or your you know, logo, specific size, shape, whatever it is. So, so that is one thing that you can actually search for and hunt for um, that can give you a tell that your corporate identity is being abused, regardless of whether it's coming through one of the proxies I'm talking about or if they're simply doing you know, copy and paste into their, their, their uh, adversarial infrastructure. So, uh, I've, I've walked through a lot of um, specific ideas, techniques, things like that. Um, you can do this. Um, the last thing I want to point out here is simulate attacks. Um, you don't have to be a red teamer to do red teamy things, okay? It's not as technologically sophisticated as those cool red teamers would have you to believe, okay? Um, setting up Evil Nginx is as simple as spinning up a Docker container, okay? 
So run these types of tests against your organization to see what you see. What do you see in your logs? Um, you know, what is the user experience like? Those types of things. Um, so I strongly encourage doing that. Um, so you got this. You can do this. All right, so I've got, uh, I am going to post um, slides within two to three days. Um, you can catch those out there. Um, if it's Mastodon, I will pin it to the, uh, the top of my profile for, for a little while so you can catch those there. So I want to thank all of you for your time. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your work schedule to be here at B-Sides. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say I, I greatly value uh, the contribution each and every one of you make on a day-to-day -day basis to the safety of the organization and the people that you're responsible for protecting. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'll take questions for about five minutes here if anybody has any. So I, I saw the Microsoft authentication window, and this, that came up, like where it has someone looks at the URL and you said, hey, we shouldn't rely on our users to, to look for that. And I, I completely agree. But I, I don't, maybe it's just my organization. It, that issue came up as, uh, in, in another like, uh, cyber group that I, that I attend. I'm like, hey, they pointed this out. I went back to my, my company. I didn't see a URL in, in that authentication screen. So that, that's weird. Like just seeing, the, just seeing that banner itself or having that revealed. So I don't know like what's common or not, but I was like, well, I... So, so what I see commonly is, um, I'm not so much sure about the Microsoft side, but, but, but oftentimes what we do with our th authentication pages is we put them in pop-up windows yeah. that are like modal and they don't have an address bar in them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, that makes this attack even worse. Well, yeah, just well, just seeing it to me at my organization would be a, but I didn't know if it was an option for like other people. You know, it shows up. Yeah, the I'm, fact I'm, that it's there is like, well, this is weird. But yeah, I, I wouldn't trust my users for that either. If right. I, exactly. Exactly. And and I, I have another whole another hobby horse talk about why putting all the onus on users is terrible as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hi. So. With the, um, the session token thing that you described, there's generally that, um, sorry. Oh. Yeah, a little closer to the mic, thank you. Um, so with the um, session token um, attacks, um, I guess one of the countermeasures that you can take is reducing the validity of that token. But how do you strike that balance like with user productivity? Because often users are quite lazy, and your IT managers are going, you know, I don't want to deal with complaints from users about constantly needing to authenticate and re-authenticate. Absolutely. So, so the, the, the crux of the question is, how do you balance uh, user experience against you know, uh, the, the, the life cycle of a token and making people re-authenticate? Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, an adversary can, can get in and, and establish persistence very, very fast. Um, so I don't think the solution is shorter token life cycles. Um, Microsoft is starting to roll out, or they do, they have, um, uh, risky behaviors or risky sign-on events. Um, I would strongly recommend implementing those. Um, uh, and this is actually where my gripe against Microsoft is. I don't think they should allow uh, logons from things like uh, browser agents that aren't actual web browsers. Um, I mean, it's such stupid low-hanging fruit, but it still seems to work for some reason. Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I, I think that should happen is there should be a matchup between um, the token and the actual browser agent that was used for the token, okay? So if your browser agent changes and you have a successful auth with that token, it should just auto-invalidate the token. Microsoft has not implemented this to my knowledge. They have some token protection stuff, but it doesn't quite go this far. Um, but, but frankly, um, there's no reason why you should be able to proffer the same token between Chrome and Firefox, even on your same machine, because that, that token is just sitting there in a cookie in the lo local cookie store. So it should never be proffered from anywhere other than the first place. But that's, that's what they're doing.
I guess first, first more of a comment. I have heard Microsoft has something in beta that's exactly what you're talking about. I, yeah, they're I, working. I, I know they're working on it. Uh, my question is, Microsoft authenticators, passwordless authentication. Microsoft claims it's uh, phishing resistance. Is it according to CISA? Yes, I do believe it is. Thank you. So if you're using the the, the right configuration, Windows Hello for Business, um, and Microsoft's authenticator. Um, if you're using in the right configuration, it's storing the uh, the certificate in uh, in an enrolled device, uh, whether that be your Windows laptop, things like that. Yes, um, there there are a lot of great great options there. Um, I'm a Mac user in an enterprise. None of those are available to me. Um, so so the, so the problem is uh, that's great if you're an all Windows fleet. Um, it starts to break down when you have any type of BYOD, Mac situations, things like that. So. I've gotten a stop sign. I want to thank all of you for your time again and the fantastic questions. Thank you very much.